it's time to take a break from your day and let us build it in a positive way. This is Break and Build with Brad and Billy. Welcome back, everybody. We are in episode 13, Halloween month coming up soon. So episode 13, timing it up. Brad's favorite number. And no, we're all about Brad. My favorite number is seven, <laughs> but my birthday's on the 13th, so it's close. Yeah. There you go. So I know, I know Brad's numbers, uh, favorite number seven, obviously. We've been doing a lot of business together for a long time. <laughs> Six and seven are our Six favorite numbers. Seven. So today we're going to get more into Brad. And Brad left us off talking about how he's done big events for big companies. Um, going from basically rewinding you guys, uh, a job at a detail shop, opening opening his own detail company, working at Walgreens for a manager. And now Brad's all the way into like pretty high level productions, meaning he's virtually a TV producer for a video game company, which is incredibly awesome. So Brad's leveraged himself and he's dropped a ton of amazing Easter eggs. If you guys haven't watched last episode, you need to watch it because there's a lot of knowledge you can take away, especially if you're trying to level yourself up. And now we're going to start going into Brad's story. So I think where we left off, we, we were talking about like just kind of like the high res intro events. Yep. So maybe we can go into like, you know, what it takes to run like, you know, because we did the first event, which we talked about with Bonafide. That's where everything went haywire with AGL and everything. That was Brad's first production live, super live, like big event, correct? Yeah. And that and that event, it's you can say it's a big event, but then like you look at Worlds which yeah. is like, you know, a world championship the the next year after that. And then every year since. Exactly. It's, it, which it's scaled to be, you know, 10 times bigger than that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, so we, take us take us through the progression of you starting at Worlds mm-hmm. uh, for the first event, which was I mean, it was pretty cool, right? Like that was the biggest event you did at the time. Yeah. So, it was, right? yeah. So launch tournament is where it all started. And then mm-hmm. after that, it, it was basically like these small regional, smaller regional events where there was like mm-hmm. six to eight teams from North America or six or eight teams from Europe. And we were basically traveling around Europe to have events like every three months and then having one in America every three months. So it was this huge, just like year, two years of traveling, doing all these regional separate events um, at, at kind of that scale, working with just third party countries around or third party studios around the countries um to put on these small events because it's really hard to like move all of your gear and stuff like that so you got to find studios that know what you're doing and work with these partnered companies and kind of teach them how your flow works and how the game works and everything like that um so that kind of started off with esl studios and esl puts on a lot of um very large events for third parties and they do their own events for very large video games like um csgo and things like that so very well-known company that's kind of who we first partnered with um when we were doing uh events in other countries and um the experience working with a third party like that is an eye-opener so if Mm -hmm. you're ever used to doing things on your own and you have (laughs) your own way of doing things right which brad is a pioneer of (laughs) like you've got this mentality and, and this, this goes for anything, right? If you cut your grass a certain way and then somebody else comes and cuts your grass, you ain't going to like how that grass gets cut. Like you're just not going to, it's not going to be edged, right? There's going to still be weeds. They cut it too short and now your grass is brown, right? Like there's so many things that can go wrong. So it's like you're working with this other company. You're going to a country that you don't, you've never been to. You're going to a studio you've never been to with your one or two staff members. And like we had a a computer with us and we get there and we have to teach them how all the game is going to work. They're familiar. They're very familiar with esports, right? So they understand how Mm -hmm. esports works and the general things like that. They have a nice studio They have equipment, but they don't know how our game works. They don't know how our flow works or anything like that. So we have to teach the directors and we have to teach all the graphic guys. Here's how our game works and everything like that. And then you know, you're working with them for practice. And one of my biggest gripes that I get when I work with these third party companies is the setup time and the practice. So I am a stickler for getting into these events as early as possible, working as long as I have to, to get stuff set up and then having a long time to practice. Um, like I said before, like, no matter how long you practice, how long you test stuff, stuff is always going to go wrong at an event. 
So getting the practice in is always good. Then you feel comfortable with the people you're working with. When you're working with new people, you want that extra time as well because you just want to feel comfortable, right? It's like starting mm -hmm. a new job. Like you feel very uncomfortable day one and you got to warm up to people. You got to figure out routines. You got to get to know them. You got to develop relationships. It That doesn't happen overnight. Well, in this mm -hmm. industry, it needs to happen overnight basically because you don't have more than one or two days to develop those relationships and trust the other people that are going to be running this event with you. And so a lot of times with these third parties, they don't work at the speed that we were used to. So it would be a lot slower. It would be, you know, oh, we did this for six hours today. We're done, even though it's only a quarter of the way done. And we're like, oh, we're ready to work like a 20 hour day to just get this done and be done with this. So we don't have to worry about anything. So we found out is a lot of times you would be working until the wire and it would be like until the second the event is about to start, you're still plugging cables and you're still testing stuff. And then you mm -hmm. have no practice because mm -hmm. it just, it's a lot slower. It's different work ethics. It's tons of different things. Um, so that was probably the biggest struggle that we always ran into with a lot of third partner companies is we wanted stuff to function our way and you can't force these other vendors and these other third party partners to work at that speed. You just physically can't, they have their own agendas and what their work ethic is and their agendas are could be, you know, setting up a table and ours can be setting up 10 tables. Well, mm -hmm. they're only going to work at their speed. It's not going to change. So then you have to figure out how to change just your whole mentality, your whole thought process, your whole workflow to be able to accommodate for that and mm -hmm. not get stressed out because that's putting a lot of extra pressure on you as a person when stuff is not going the way that you want it to go and it's not functioning at what you're used to. So you really have to be able to adapt and you have to be able to accept that everybody is not going to work at the same pace. Everybody's not going to you know, function the same way. And honestly, like another way that I noticed that is when I moved from Chicago down to the South, it's mm -hmm. a very similar thing, like up North, right. the work ethic up there and the speed that you work. And like, that's probably why I am the way I am is like, we're trained as employees to be dicks. Like nonetheless, like we are raised to be like these hot headed go getters that don't take no for an answer because mm -hmm. you're answering to higher powers and it's such a cutthroat work environment up in the north because everybody is this go-getter super fast worker that like mm -hmm. you're always at each other's throats and then you come down to the south and it's like if you have that mm -hmm. mentality man people do not like you they do not like working with you like you're just in a really bad spot because everyone down here is way more laid back way more mellow tone like it's it's just like, it's slower, right? Mm -hmm. And be, being slower is not a bad thing. Like, let me preface with that, but you have to adjust. And then like, you're doing stuff fast. And it's like, you know, you get assigned 10 projects. And it's like, I am done in a day. And they're like, oh, that was like for two weeks of work. And you're like, oh, well, what am I supposed <laughs> to do then for the next two weeks? Like, that's not two <laughs> weeks of work. Like, what is this? So wherever you grow up and wherever you start working and whatever, however, you know, you're raised, you're going to have these different, you know, work ethics and, you know, ways that you want things to work. And mm -hmm. as you get new jobs and as you move around and as you work with different companies and partners and vendors and all these things throughout your career and throughout your life, you're going to find out that it is not the same everywhere. And instead of getting frustrated with that, you have to adapt to it because if you get frustrated and you have that same mentality that you have at one place to another, you're not going to get along with their culture. You're not going to get along with a lot of stuff. And you're just going to cause more problems for your stuff. You're going to be getting frustrated and you're just going to go haywire. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I think that that's something that you'll experience no matter where you go. And it's something that we experience firsthand at every event we pretty much go to with vendors and with partnered companies. Um, so it's, it's a very good skill set to develop and just to be knowledgeable about and aware of that your way is not always going to be the way everybody else works. So you have mm -hmm. to adapt and you have to communicate. So during that time frame, do you think that you learned something that would benefit you guys from moving at a slower pace? Or was it just uh, an adaption for that time frame? And then you would realize like, hey, you know, obviously we don't do it like this. Or were there any like takeaways that they maybe showed you a way to be more efficient because they weren't working at your speed? 
I think really what we learned is we learned planning more becomes more important. Mm -hmm. So like the weeks and the months before the event, having our ducks in a row and having Mm -hmm. more stuff together ready to go. So when you show up somewhere, like 90% of the work is done. So then it Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what you encounter on site in that small limited time frame, you're able to handle it because a lot of the, a lot more work was done pre-event. I think that that's kind of more what what we learned. Um, Because yeah, I mean, almost every event we've run into stuff like that, like a vendor shows up five hours late and our whole schedule is off, right? Mm -hmm. One electrical component in the event space when you're setting up goes wrong and it puts you behind six hours. You literally Mm -hmm. just like, you have to adapt to it and to avoid that stuff, the more you can have done beforehand and be prepared for these things, then it's okay on site. Um, And sometimes you just have to know like, Hey, we have to adjust things. We have to work later or, you know, just move your schedule around. But um, yeah. And the other thing that's about it. Go ahead. No. Okay. The other thing I was also hearing is you created a culture in your working environment where it was like, you know, fast paced, efficient. And then in order to, you know, with a purpose of getting to the event to be able to prepare as much as possible so that you guys are prepared for anything that does go wrong. If it, if, if there's any type of uh, connection issues or whatever like that, you know, obviously you say everything always can go wrong and will go mm-hmm. wrong at some point or when goes wrong. But in order for you to get to those events, and I've witnessed it in my, you know, and obviously AGL, and that was just the beginning, it's like, you know, bust your butt for the first day to set up and then donate the second day if you only had two days to just practice and do whatever it takes on the first day to be able to get that. And so, you know, with you being the lead of this event stuff that's going on, your culture of what you created in, in that company was everybody just knew that this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. Like on our side, it was very much a, once you get brought onto the team and you see like how we're doing and how we're working, how we're prepping, you just kind of know that that's the prepping that goes into it. Like everything has to be labeled. Everything has to be organized. Everything has to Mm -hmm. have its own place. Um, just to limit the, the chaoticness and, you know, keep it structured is really the, the main point of, of what it is. Mm -hmm. So how did you guys go from, I guess, like what was, what, how did your vision go from the launch tournament and, and to preface this, when we talk about the launch tournament, it was like, it was more of like a theater, uh, old, like rock bands. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever been into a concert where you see maybe like, not to say these guys are washed (laughs) up, but like something like poison come these days, right? Like they're typically not going to sell out this massive theater anymore. Like they're more of the local. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I've seen a band, I've seen poison in the exact same type (laughs) of studio, uh, you know, where it's like, you know, it's kind of an older place, maybe built in the 1980s. Um, no, not really too many upgrades. You know, you totally know that it's like made for bars and concerts. Yeah. It's like themed around a bar, right? It's like a bar with seats is what it feels like. Exactly. Like you have this huge bar in the entryway and then you have this like, you know, stage, whatever, however the setup is. And it's a little bit older, no upgrades made. You can totally tell that like, you know, it's just a rock band. Like you just come here. It's like a club vibe, right? It's like, yeah, totally. It's like like you're in a club more than a big, like, you know, football stadium. That's, exactly. That's like you get there sober thing. and you're like, this place is gross until you have a couple <laughs> drinks and then you don't even realize where you're at anymore, yeah. right? So that's like yeah. the purpose of this venue. And then we take it into one, what, approximately a year yeah, later? It's about a, it a year, year later. It's, it's, it's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. So we take it to a year later and now we're at the Cobb Energy Convention Center. I believe that's yep. the name. And this place is like a state-of-the-art brand new facility that is gorgeous for one, two, completely different. Yeah. And like, it is just like this remarkable. And so what goes on at this place typically is like symphony concerts Mm. and we have opera places. So now we're going from like a beat up old bar rock venue to this like high level investor type symphony, you know, ambiance that is absolutely amazing. When I walked into this place, I couldn't even believe like the stark contrast of the two events. So how did you take that, you know, 
to this incredibly new experience that like what I mean, obviously it was a company wide thing, but like the when I walked into there and saw the difference in production and like all the setup, it was just like, you know, there's been a lot of of planning to get that goes into this. Yeah, I mean, it was the first it was the first world's event. So we knew that there was a lot that we had to prove. Right. And the biggest component to that when you say prove like uh does there competition um i would say are you you just saying it to your own people you want to show them that like esports is a thing for this game i think it's a little bit of everything right you have to prove it to the company you work for that you can do this and that the reason Mm -hmm. that they've been investing in esports and stuff is for this reason and for this big event so you can't fail like failure is not an option in this Mm -hmm. case and then you have all these other esports companies that put on events, right? And there's this hidden thing of when you look at another big event, you're just automatically competing with them, right? You're like, this is mm-hmm. what they did. Can we do it better? Can we m- match it? When you watch something, oh, here's the mistakes we saw. Let's make sure we don't do those mistakes, right? It's it's no different than, you know, if you're a quarterback in the NFL and you want to get better stats than another quarterback. It's that same hidden competitive standpoint of you want to compete with the the people that are bigger than you on a but on a scale that we can do right so you look at these mm-hmm. bigger events and you go we want to be that we know we can't be it but how close can we get them can we put on a better show or as good of a show as them with less mm-hmm. staff and a lower budget and then it's just to the players and the fans as well right like these people that play the play the games watch the games invest in the games you want them to have this experience that they've never had before. And you want them to come to this event and walk away saying that is a staple point in my life that I will never forget. Like you want to create this memory for them. And we have the privilege of being able to create these memories for people from, you know, the signage when you're walking up to the door to Mm -hmm. the badge that you put around your neck to how you view it in the big screen and how you shake in your seats when things are happening, right? It's no different than if you are a Star Wars or a Marvel fan and you go to a brand new movie in the movie theater. You're cre- mm-hmm. The movie theaters and the people who make those movies are creating this experience for you to remember for the rest of your life. So like, that's, that's what we're doing. So you, you have all these people that you want to impress and not let down and, and make it happen. So the, the scariest thing was it's a brand new venue that we've never been to. That's always a what if factor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a lot of new technology, a lot of new screens, a, a lot of new vendors, a lot of new. That's what this event was. And so we had to figure out how do you take a lot of new and how do you make it to where it's not a lot of new? If, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like if there's 10 yep. new things. How do we make it to where it only feels like there's two new things because we're confident that the other things are, you know, really good and really easy and going to go smooth. Um so yeah, I mean there's a there's a lot to it. So um you know, we don't run on big staff. We were doing this with staff of people who've never done events like this. So like we're all super green still. We've only done the events that we've done throughout the year. Nothing of this size, nothing of this coordination. Um but the team that we have is very good at figuring stuff out and they're very tech savvy and they're very good at problem solving. So we're confident that whatever is thrown at us, we're going to be able to figure it out. And when something happens, as long as it's not noticeable to the audience or it's not noticeable, you know, to the people viewing, it's okay. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's all, that's all you can do. And I mean, we learn a lot at every event, every event, you're going to learn stuff. So all you can do is, is learn and take what you learn from that event and bring it to the next one. So um, there was a couple issues that, you know, were minor and a couple that were major and you know we take what we learn from that and we go on to the next one and say that's not going to happen again Mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean it's just it's just a lot of planning uh i think that more planning could have actually been done for a lot of the events that we do so uh, typically what will happen is you want to plan these events like a year ahead of time and that almost never Mm -hmm. happens typically you are Mm -hmm. planning an event of this caliber in like two to three months Um, usually you have the venue locked in and then beyond that, like, because you're so busy with other things and there's so much going on, you can't get focus on this, 
these events until way closer to it. So then like, you know, there's not enough time for you to change stuff or to have mistakes or to have any of these things go wrong. So it's definitely always very last minute planning. Um, and there's a lot of things that come together like the week beforehand. So uh, it's, it's definitely a super active environment. Um, if you like that type of environment, that is mm -hmm. just always keeps you on your toes. It's, it's the place yeah. to be. Cool. So I think that uh, one of the things I wanted to backtrack to, and I think this is really valuable for everybody to, to take in, um, it was when you were talking about looking at your competition. Um, and I think that maybe people overheard the underlying message that you dropped in there, and they probably just took it as just compete with your competition. And re in reality is what I heard is you look at what other people are doing, you figure that out, right? And then you say, hey, well, well what, what, what have we done? It's like, it's like you compete with the competition, but in the end goal, like you only have onus to yourself and you have to obviously compete with yourself because if you're always competing with the competition, you can never like get better than where you've been. Cause you'll always be, I mean, you're never going to get better than the competition if you only just look at them because they're innovating and you're not, you, you compete with this last event. They already have something new for this new event. So you look at this and you're like, okay, well, we really like this. So you're taking two really powerful strategies. You're taking modeling of somebody who's doing something that really works. And then you're competing against yourself from the last event. And then you're also like seeing, okay, well with this model, what things do I think could be improved upon further than that? So now you're innovating at a place where you can rapidly exponentiate your growth past somebody potentially in some regards, which I'm sure that you guys have succeeded in, in producing some type of new, you know, whether it be, you know, prompt, uh, I don't know, I mean, switching, whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, don't know yeah. all your tech terms, but you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're just, you're creating a new, a new way to do something. And for us, the biggest part of that was we knew that we had less staff than most of these big mm -hmm. events. So that would be the first thing we'd always take in consideration where it's like these big events, that are going on have 30 to 50 people working on it. Okay, we have 10. How do we do that? And we would create a lot of automate, automated systems. We would mm -hmm. program a lot of stuff to where you can press a button and it does 10 people's jobs. So mm -hmm. whenever we would see something, we would say, how is that done? Okay, it's done with five people in this way. How do we do that with one person? Mm. And so like that would be where we would innovate the most. And I think where we have innovated the most is how do we keep the number of people on staff low? How do we bring in little to no contractors for events and be able to automate stuff to where it doesn't affect the stress on people or the flow of the show or the product? Um, so that would be the, the easiest thing that aligns with what you were saying. Got it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's virtually it. I just want you guys to take away that and not overlook that, you know, maybe when I talk or when Brad talks, we drop some things and these things are super impactful. And if you just overlook and just listen to the story, you may miss some of these key points that, <laughs> that go on behind the scenes. So now we got the first, how did the first tournament go? Um, I mean, it went good. I mean, I didn't, I, I can't At remember anything. Yeah. Huh? At the new venue. At, at the yeah, Convention. I mean, it went, it went good. I can't remember anything for that one that was uh, a staple point of wrong or, or, mm -hmm. that, or that, that happened. Uh, nothing in my mind calls out something at that event. So that event was successful. And cool. it being successful, right, allows the esports scene and my job to continue for the next five years. And, mm -hmm. you know, we just keep innovating on sets and events and things like that. And we can go into set building another time and design and, and stuff, but we continue kind of that path. And then what happened, um, about four years into it, we decided so you guys have done four years. So an event every, every year for four years, a big event. Yeah. And then there were smaller ones. So like there's, there's a ton, right. I can't even tell you how many events, but we were traveling around the world. Like I said, all the time we were doing smaller local events. Well, we did a lot of charity events um, as well um, for like Make-A-Wish and Red Cross um, and Child's Play. So we usually do one or two charity events every year. Um, and those are super fun to do. Uh, and then what happened was is we decided or whoever decided, 
um, that the esports division was going to kind of split off and mm -hmm. become their own company called Skillshot. Uh, so this was a super exciting point in my career because we got to now be a part of creating an esports broadcast company that is not tied to a specific video game. So mm -hmm. up to this point, we've been tied to everything that Hires is doing and we're not doing anything outside of it because like we are this internal production company. We are there to fuel the fire of their esports. And so now we, we branch off, we create this new entity. Um, we're still doing all the high risk stuff. We're, you know, still right next door to them in our own facility and building. Uh, but now we have the luxury to go out and work for other companies. Uh, so this is where it starts to get into working on other games and other companies. And the quick and dirty of it is the first event we got to do was a Halo event. No way. Yeah. So we went and we worked with UGC, uh, uh -huh. you know, with, with Matt, who helped supply a lot of stuff for us during our Halo ventures. Um, so did you guys get the contract or the liberty to be able to work with Matt based on your previous relationship from AGL? Um, that's the only reason that we knew him. So yeah. like, I think that if we didn't know each other, he probably would have been way more skepti skeptical about bringing us in on that deal because he'd be like, who are these people just randomly wanting to come into my house? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yep. But because we knew all the people, all the halo, how it all works, they had this, they, they needed some equipment. So, you know, we were able to help them out with equipment to make their main stream quality better. We were able to give them some more people to help them. And then we took on halo one, and this hmm. is some crazy stuff. So I'll do this as fast as I can. Halo 1 came out in, I don't even know, 2000 or something like that. Yeah. So this game doesn't even have like a score in game to tell you what the score is or who's killing each other. It doesn't tell you wow. anything. Like you're just like playing. Is this the play. remastered one or this is no, just straight on this Xbox? This is straight Xbox tube TVs. Wow. So like nothing so we build this entire system out to support this and bring it to like this new digital age so we have this scoring system we build we build all these graphics to show the weapon timers and all this oh stuff gosh. so we, we create all these graphics to show when like the rockets and the sniper are going to spawn we do map intros for every single thing uh mm -hmm. for every single like level we create this whole custom scoring thing and we're literally sitting there as people are dying clicking buttons on which team they're getting killed. <laughs> and when a weapon would get picked up, we're manually pressing it. So like w me and my, my team are just like, we're going ham on this. And like, we've never stared uh -huh. at a screen so hard to see right. what is happening in a game. Yeah. But it was such a cool thing because this is one of like the oldest video game communities out there. And they're like uh -huh. one of the most die hard competitive communities. So to be able to take something that's been around that long and reinvent it, to be able to view it how you view esports now mm -hmm. just it was a huge thing for the community right and it was just it was a huge thing to say look here's what we can do because we had we had to prove ourselves right nobody knew we could do anything outside of what we've been doing with high so we had to go out uh -huh. and we had to say look what we can I know. do <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we come out of the gate like look we're gonna take this game that has no infrastructure for esports, has no yeah. spectator, has no stats, has no visuals that when you watch it, you're just watching people kill each other and you have no idea what's going on. And we're yeah. gonna make it a viewable esport. Never had done this before. And we we did that. Like we successfully did it. It was phenomenal. And then we also ran a full open bracket, you know, free for all there and we streamed all the free for all with, you know, all the feeds and everything like that as well. So like we we came out hidden hidden super strong and we made a name for skill shot from day one. Nice. Um, so it was, it was really good. It was really good to get our foot in the door and be a part of that event. And then that kind of allowed us to start to branch out to bigger companies and with the connections that we have, you know, just in the video game industry, um, we had the opportunity to work with overwatch and mm -hmm. we worked with the Atlanta rain. So each overwatch team, you know, uh, a couple of them put on their own events in like the first season of the Overwatch League stuff. And we got to basically help represent the Atlanta Reign and be their home, their like home stadium production company for yeah. the event. 
Um, so because we'd done so many events in the Cobb, we we looked at a bunch of venues, we worked with them, and now this was this was crazy because our job was the in-house experience. And what that means is if you are attending the event, our job is to represent Atlanta Reigns home stadium. So if you go to mm. any sporting stadium and you are there, the experience that you're going to have as a fan being in that stadium, that is what we had to come up with and create and control. So mm, we really do, we, we create everything from, you know, fan experience stations to signage to, when you're sitting there and something happens in the game, what does the audience experience from audio to lighting? Um, you know, commercial breaks. We we did fun stuff in commercial breaks, like chugging a, a Coke, because um, Coke was like a sponsor there. So you would you would chug like a, a Coke um, slushy because they had a slushy station uh-huh. there. So you know you're gonna get a brain freeze from that. So it's like we would do like fun little commercial breaks. Like if you went to a sporting yeah. thing, like the kiss cam or the t-shirt yeah. gun thing, it's literally the exact same thing, but for video games, is what we were creating. And it was it was just next level. Like the sponsors that they had and the small little cool segments we got to do, um, really got it super hyped. And we got to do a little concert and stuff like that. But then on top of that. So we create this whole fan experience and now the Overwatch team and all their production and all their TV trucks come in. So now we're coordinating with ESPN. Mm. We're coordinating with Overwatch team who is sending out to ABC and the Disney channel and online on, on Twitch. So there's all these broadcasts and what they do. And this was like, this was just, it's crazy. So like they're doing a broadcast for Twitch And then they're doing a separate broadcast for TV. So they've got two sets of casters, two sets of desks, two sets of everything, right? And they're doing two separate streams from two separate TV trucks that have to be running at the exact same pace. But the reason that they're separate is because the casters have to say different things for different channels. And there's Uh commercial breaks that line up differently. So it's like when they're coming into game, you have TV and the internet two different trucks aligning themselves to go live, to go into game, to do all these things, to go to break. And now we're controlling all the in-venue screens, all the in-venue music, that whole experience. So while those two are coordinating online, we have to coordinate with them for everything that the fans are seeing in person and what's happening on the screens, because that translates to what's in their camera shots and you know what can be heard over the caster mics, everything like that. So. It's three separate productions, one in venue, one on TV, one on the internet that all have to work together to put on the exact same show for different audiences. It's pretty nuts. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. Like nuts. It is crazy. So you've got, and then were were they like on different sides of the venue because they're in different trucks. So they brought trucks. Oh, in the trucks. They're in trucks outside and then we're on, we're backstage. So like, well, I'm talking about for the caster purposes because the caster different parts of the venue. In... Yep, different okay, parts cool. of the venue. And yeah. where is this taking place? This was at at the Cobb Energy Center as well. So okay, the okay, venue okay. that we're familiar with. So yeah, there's different casters at different places with different camera shots, and one's going to TV, one's going to the the internet, and then they would do mm. really crazy switches where they would have to switch. So like, the first truck would run the first half of the day and it's like, okay, we're only online, right? So we're only going online. The first truck is running everything. And then your TV window is for like a three hour window. And it's for like the match of the day, right? It's your home team, Atlanta versus Orlando match. And now the second truck has been prepping for that all day. Mm. And like, because it's special and they have to do a difference. So now Truck A has to kick it over to truck B without anybody knowing that it's a completely different team taking over the broadcast. And it's just like, yeah, I've, I don't know. The coordination of it and like how many people are talking at once and knowing the voice you have to listen to is insane. But during this whole process and working with another company and another vendor like this, now they're our client, right? I'm not running the show. So there are clients. So we go from running the show to having a client and doing everything that they want and making sure everything is perfect for them from designing the scenery to making sure the lighting is going to be good. Like we had to do all that exactly how they wanted it. And, you know, we did get to like, you know, have input on 
here's how we want the intro to be. And it was really good working with them because, you know, I got to throw my creativity into the process of the intro of the teams and the intro of the event and, you know, designing all of this stuff. So it was really cool to be able to be a part of that. And what I found is I really did like working with clients like that because mm -hmm. it took the pressure off me to have to come up with everything. And instead I was just making sure that everything was going to run and function correctly for them. So it was, it was a different role, but it was a super cool role because mm -hmm. they would be like, Hey, this is wrong. Can you fix it? Cool. I'm good at that. I'll just go, I'll go fix it. I'll go find the people that can fix it. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that I'm just really good at is like coordinating all that stuff. So it was this very, very just different role, but it was so enjoyable. And the end product that came out of it was unbelievable like i've never mm. seen fans like that in esports i've never heard the venue so loud like we're backstage behind like stuff that dampens the sound and like we're screaming to be able to hear each other because <laughs> it is so loud in there like i can't even tell you so like that was our first like big big boy experience of a really really big company as our client and it was awesome and then because we did so well with that, we were able to then work with Supercell with something. And this is kind of the last one that I'll wrap this up with. Supercell does Clash Royale. They do Brawl Stars, super big mobile game company. Okay. You know their games. They're on the top five of the mobile store nonstop throughout existence. You know who Supercell is. You probably play their game at some point, even if you don't know, you do. Um, so they have this new game that comes out and... They're our client again, and, and in this instance, this game has no esports scene. So what we have to do is we have to develop an entire esports for this new game for them. We're like, cool, mm -hmm. we've done this with several games with you know high res in the past. Like this is right up our alley. So we work with a client instead of ourselves to come up with an entire online esports plan for a new game. And it's really cool being able to take experience that you've developed over the past several years. That, and when you were creating something for ourselves to be able to then put that towards somebody else and take everything that you've learned and all the mistakes that you've done and be like, Hey, we can help you not make these mistakes because we've already made these mistakes. So like, mm. we know what's going to work, what's not going to work. We know, you know, the infrastructure we have to have for, it. we know all these things. And, um, you know, it wasn't an in-person event, but it was a full online experience and working with a client on a daily basis to get something like that to run for a whole year is a whole nother feat inside of itself. Um, so we just went out along this, this whole thing of, of having these clients like this, super big name companies. We put our foot in the door and everything. And where this has ended up to this day is basically... Um, Skillshot actually completely branched off from hi -Rez. They're on their own, doing their own thing now. And hi -Rez maintained an internal production company to do their games. So they kind of fully split. hi -Rez wanted their in-house in stuff, which is still kicking to this day and going strong. Um, and now I actually don't do production anymore. So I actually am now on the video game side of things, working on games and be you know, being a part of the design process for video games and the publishing process of video games. So my career this year has taken complete turn off of everything that I've done my whole life. And I've now been learning an entirely new thing. So it's like starting a new job all over again. Um, but if there's one thing that I know, it's from all of that stuff and working with all those clients and working with all those vendors and understanding how everybody look, functions differently and what it's like to develop those relationships every time you're working at a new event. I was able to take everything that I learned from that and have that in the back of my mind when I'm in this new position and on a brand new team that has no idea who I am and knows I don't have any experience. I have to build trust with them, right? I have to show mm -hmm. them that I can fit into this team. I, can, I have to show them that I can learn what I'm doing and bring something valuable um, because you know, I know that I put vendors in that situation and I put these partners in that situation where you don't trust them. It's your first time doing something with them. They got to earn your trust and prove yourself. So I was on the other side of that, you know, at the start of the year in this new role. And I'll tell you what, best decision I've ever made though. It's yeah, 
it is it is a it is a great great thing and and learning new stuff and keeping your brain fresh is fantastic but um yeah i mean that's that's the event stuff man like it was a it was a wild roller coaster from doing stuff for myself to doing stuff for clients and just this whole plethora of of everything um i don't know what else i got on that i could talk about <laughs> this for awesome. for years but i'm trying yeah. to to summarize it for you guys <laughs> yeah so um i would say one huge takeaway is the value of relationship capital. Yeah. You guys, like relationships literally could make or break your career over. If you if we talk about this, so we were doing AGL. I think we probably met Matt and you, uh, UGC in, let's say like 2013. 14, 13. 13? Okay, 13. so 13. And then Brad's working for them, what, in 2018 or 19? Yeah, 2018, yep. Yep. So we're talking a four year span, which with probably little to no contact yep. because, you know, they're still doing their thing in the halo scene and I'm not really sure what else they do to be quite honest, but they were doing really gears of war. They did a bunch of stuff for gears of war as well. Gears of war. Yep. Cool. Really well deserved. And then four years later, they're putting on a halo one tournament and Brad has an instant in because they know Brad. Right. So like do not undervalue. I would say that like relationship capital might be like one of the biggest assets to business careers can, because it can literally get you almost anything you want if that person knows you're trustworthy, knows your work ethic, knows your value, which they did of Brad because they've seen Brad do these streams at a very under budget yet overly delivered scenario when we had with AGL, right? So that's amazing for number one. And for number two, it's really cool to hear your client experience because you know, typically when we would do clothing mm -hmm. um, and produce in that manner for other clients, it felt like it almost hindered our ability to be creative, right? Because they have yeah. such strict guidelines where it's like, no, you can't change our logo this color. Like, and we're like, dude, if you do like this slight small alteration to your logo, like it's going to make the design look amazing. Then like, absolutely not. So <laughs> we have to design around that, yeah. which in my experience, and I believe that you probably felt a little bit of the same way, it wasn't as fun because it's like, yeah, uh, like, you know, this is going to be so cool. They're like, well, we can't do that. And I'm like, okay, so you just want like your logo on the front of the shirt. They're like, yeah, we're like, okay, yeah, well, all right. There's definitely instances where like you can feel like the vendor or the client, whoever you're working for, is just going to completely own everything, right? And your opinion yeah. doesn't matter. What I have learned from working for clients and vendors working for us is value everybody's opinion because you have these people in these departments and situations because they are the experts they are the ones who are knowledgeable about it so like if we're being hired for a certain thing you got to trust us right otherwise why are you hiring us right good point but it's cool to see that you were able to step into a different scenario. Yeah, where it wasn't just Externally from what previously may have been way too controlled. And mm -hmm. now you're able to bring your expertise and unleash this creativity, which I'm sure provided a ton of value. And, you know, they were able to see that and you were able to like feel good about doing that as opposed to being like stifled. Because, you know, when you're a creative entrepreneur, in my opinion, I'm sure you probably also agree that there's nothing worse than like having that being stifled down and being yeah. like, no, that's not how we're like, cause like you said, value everybody's opinion. Like if we're coming to you for clothing, you know, we've been doing clothing, we've been selling clothing. We see what sells. If you're not, if you're not, if you're just developing something new, it's like, you're just going off what you think is going to look good. Right. <laughs> and right. we've done that and seen it not work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Trust the people that you put in the positions you put them in. And that's, that's from vendors, clients to employees, to everything. Like, you you're not hiring somebody or working with somebody because you have to you've chosen to do it in some some realm of of choosing so you have to just trust them and and hope right. you know for the best that's all you can do exactly <laughs> i feel like that's the life lesson right there along with many other ones thank you brad for uh delivering all this knowledge uh extremely valuable lessons in here as well Guys, even if you can't always relate to the stories in every facet, there are massive amount of underlying lessons, work ethics, uh, different mindsets that you can take away when you hear Brad and myself talk about how we do things, where we do it, when we do it. Because uh, 
you know, we've been lucky, but lucky as well as, you know, worked pretty hard to be where we've gotten to be. So um, we've had to overcome a lot of obstacles and we hope that uh, every single part of the journey, including this amazing TV production journey that Brad's been on, has been super eye-opening and lightning of how to get yourself basically from uh, a high school diploma <laughs> all the way to the top level, right? And we judge high school diplomas like they're not valuable, but with worth at work ethic and having the skill set to just learn everything and just be super hungry, the, you can virtually get to anywhere you want. And yep. no piece of paper will dampen that for you when you become one of the best. I agree 100 <laughs> percent all right guys well thank you for tuning in we appreciate you guys being here we are going to see you out on that next episode next week episode 14